Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I think there's some... Did y'all find some seats back there? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a few spread out if you need one. Good evening and welcome to the McFadden Ward House. Um, I'm Belle Morian. I'm the program director here. And we're just so thrilled to have you all here tonight. Um, and we, we want you to hear our groundbreaking, intrepid, interesting speaker and paleontologist, Andre Lujan. Yesterday I was talking with Andre and um, about this spectacular dig he's doing and um, he's working on it. I said, well, Andre, how do you keep people from going in that dig when you're not there and everything? He goes, they'll never find it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the measures taken to find, excavate, remove, and preserve a fossil are tremendous. And um, but before we delve into Andre's story, I'd like to tempt you and give you a glimpse into a few of our upcoming events for the fall. Friday evening, October 20th, we have a really fun one. We'll, we'll be um, looking at swamp pop music. We'll be outside in the gardens. We'll have music in the gardens. It's so much fun. You bring your lawn chair, your picnic basket, and you come, you hear the music. And then we're also going to have... Um, a little brief history of the genre by Rachel Stiles from Lamar University. She'll give a brief little talk about where Swamp Pop came from. And then we've got Jive and Jean and Easy. So it's going to be fun. Then uh, on uh, Thursday, November 2nd, we were so thrilled to be able to present another lecture. And it's on, uh, it's the White House uh, historian her name is Jennifer Pickens and she's written books and she's really wonderful and she's going to give a lecture on entertaining and holiday traditions in the White House and tell us what the various presidents did in the White House what they do at Christmas how they do it it'll be very interesting and fun at that time of year then um, the tinsel on the tree will be um, our sparkling holiday open house events on Sunday, December 3rd and Sunday, December 10th from 5 to 7. We'll have Santa and caroling and music in the house, and it's just uh, really will get you in the spirit. So um, I hope you'll join us. And as always, I'd like to ask you to silence your phones before we begin. And I would like to introduce our talented and accomplished executive director, Tony Chavot. Thanks, Bill. I want to add my welcome to each of you uh, for this first lecture of our 2023-2024 lecture series. As you may have gathered from her shameless plugs, uh, Bell has put together a remarkable series that ranges from uh, fossils to swamp pop music to White House holiday traditions, and all that's in just the first two months of uh, our, our lecture series this year. Uh, these programs, coupled um, with the upcoming reopening of the historic house, which, which has been closed uh, since February for some much needed uh, electrical upgrades, provides ample reason for you to return uh, multiple times uh, in the next few months. So please mark your calendars and plan to visit us. Um, as always, I want to acknowledge the Mamie McFadden Ward Heritage Foundation, as well as the museum's board of directors whose generosity ensures that all programming here at the McFadden Ward House is free and open to the public. Tonight, we'll follow the journey of fossil digs and discoveries led by Andre Lujan. When he arrived yesterday, I understand he asked several of the staff members here at the McFadden Ward House if, if the McFadden Ward House had any fossils. And they replied, not really, just our executive director. Um, <laughs> As a result, we have several staff openings now available if, <laughs> if, if any of you are uh, looking for a job, but I digress. Uh, this evening's speaker is the founder and CEO of Paleotex, which over, for over 15 years has provided uh, uh, services such as discovering, preparing, mounting, casting, and providing professional paleontology services to museums, independent researchers, and paleontologists all around the world. With expertise in Cretaceous and Permian animals of Texas, Andre has even discovered an entirely new genre of dinosaurs. And just as important, Andre and his wife, Carrie, uh, have 
founded a nonprofit museum located in Hillsboro, Texas, named Texas Through Time, where their growing collection of hundreds of authentic fossils uh, from Texas and surrounding states are on display at no charge uh, for the viewing public. Uh, please welcome Andre Luan. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and thank you uh, for the generosity and the invitation from the McFadden Ward House to come and speak and, and share a little bit about the amazing discoveries and uh, resources that we have in our state. Uh, I'm very excited to see a lot of young uh, people in the audience tonight, uh, some aspiring paleontologists, I hope. Uh, I will be available for questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, particularly for you young uh, individuals because I believe that uh, you probably are going to have the best questions. So um, without further ado, we will get started. This is Texas Fossil Finds following the journey from the dig uh, to the museum. And a lot of people see segments of that. Um, we see pictures of paleontologists in the field. We, of course, have all visited natural history museums with amazing displays, uh, but I hope to fill in the gaps and help you understand uh, really the, the in-depth process and what it takes to get fossils uh, from the point of discovery to, to a, a museum for your viewing. Um, my interest in paleontology, like most young people, uh, began at a very young age, and I was fortunate that my parents indulged that interest. And when I was four years old, they took me to Dinosaur Valley State, uh, State Park. And I still remember the day because they were uh, very adamant that I wait till everybody was ready to get out of the car before I bolted to the river. Of course, you know, that's not how it happened. And I remember scrambling down this bank and into that dinosaur track that I'm standing in with my daughter and my son uh, and just being instantly transported through time. And I knew in that moment that this is what I have to do. Uh, it's been a long journey to get here, but that was a transformative moment in my life and one that I feel is universal throughout paleontology uh, as a gateway science. My career has taken a lot of odd twists and turns, um, but paleontology was always the end goal. Um, so a few of those are dental laboratory technology. <laughs> I remember applying for jobs when they were in the newspaper. Uh, I'm not dating myself, but I was really into that, you know, the job section in the newspaper. And I remember this job description. It said, looking for creative, uh, talented young person that works well with their hands. And I was like, that's me. So I circled it and called and made an appointment for the interview. And I showed up with my art portfolio. And because, you know, I had, it didn't say it was a dental lab, and I show up, and I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. Maybe they want me to do some art for them or something. And the guy came out in a lab coat covered in plaster, and he was like, hmm, interesting. Okay, well, uh, come back tomorrow with clothes you can get dirty in. And he really didn't interview me. He just looked at my art. Uh, but I came back the next day, and he put me right in the lab pouring models, uh, dental models, to do crown and bridge work. And I was hooked. And I learned so much about the meticulous preparation of, of models and uh, casting and molding. And that was really one of the first steps towards becoming the professional in paleontology that I am today. Secondly, environmental science. I get bored easy. So I left that field to find something that could get me closer to the dirt. Um, I found a small firm in Dallas called LCA Environmental. And I joined their team and was thrust into the world of building sciences, which was really interesting uh, to me because I got to do a lot of investigative work on sick building syndrome, uh, indoor air quality issues, and it was always about natural, uh, natural things that influenced those water penetration, the ground, uh, foundational issues, and toxic materials inside the building. So I got to do a lot of digging inside of buildings and it added to my knowledge when they put me in geotech because they knew I wasn't really into being indoors all the time. Um, so we did a lot of bridge surveys 
for the state of Texas uh, for asbestos as they were doing bridge replacements. And I would hurry through my survey as fast as I could uh, so that I could scramble down in the creek and look for fossils. And I thought, man, this is the greatest job ever because I'm getting paid to look for fossils. So those are just two of the career paths that have set me um, on my journey into paleontology. But I wanted to mention them because paleontology is a culmination of a myriad of skills and talents. Um, it's not just knowledge for research. It's really um, hand-eye coordination, imagination, artistic abilities that make a well-rounded paleont paleontologist. Uh, personal interests, many. I will not bore you with them all. Uh, so my interests are in the rich history of the Texas fossil record. That has been vastly overlooked in our state. Um, Texas is a big state and we're a proud people, but for some reason this part of our history has been grossly overlooked. Founding Texas Through Time was the culmination of over 15 years of working towards this goal. And I wanted to bring all of that history together in one place where the public could enjoy and I could educate the next generation of paleontologists. So that's me way too excited about something that I found in the field. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much a tornado when I'm, when I'm doing field work. I'll throw my backpack down, start slinging tools everywhere, and depending on how big it is, uh, depends on how big the mess is around it. Texas historical finds and resources. Um, Texas has been a hotbed of discovery for well over 100 years with Dr. Alfred Sherwood Romer and Edward Drinker Cope scouring the red beds for Permian skeletons. I feel like you know, over a century ago, you had to have a really cool name to be a paleontologist. And I thought, you know, maybe Andre Cruz Lujan will be remembered for having one of those names. Um, but the vast marine deposits that have produced incredible specimens of marine reptiles, fish, and even dinosaurs that floated out to sea, like Tenontosaurus docii discovered on the Doss Ranch in Weatherford, Texas. Um, so we have many historical finds in our state. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there has been, well, the well-documented tracks in Glenrose, uh, the famous bird trackway with an acrocanthosaurus walking beside a large sauropod dinosaur. Um, that's actually at the American Museum of Natural History. They cut it out of the Paluxy River and moved it to New York City. But lucky for us, we have more tracks than we know what to do with. So every time there's a drought and the water gets low in Glenrose, uh, hundreds of new tracks are exposed. This was paleontology a hundred years ago. Uh, now I have a big diesel truck, a bobcat, um, concrete saws, jackhammers, and generators. But if I was doing paleontology a hundred years ago, like Dr. Romer and Dr. Cope, this is what I would have been dealing with. But it's interesting because some things never change. Um, the large plaster jacket there, we're still using plaster and burlap to cover these fossils to extract them and bring them back to the museum safely. And the reason that we do that is the same reason that they put a plaster cast on your arm when it's broken. Uh, it's to immobilize those bones and prevent further damage from happening. Uh, it's a very cost-effective way to get these delicate uh, and important specimens back to the museum. Processes of discovery, excavation, prep, and display. So there's, there's a lot here. Um, this is my favorite part. So I will start with um, some of the more detailed. Finding fossils starts in the lab or the library. So you, you're never just ha you, you never just happen to be in a remote place and say, you know what, I'm going to look for fossils. Um, it starts in a room like this with a, with a young motivated person or an, an older motivated person who says, you know, I, I've, I'd like to find something and I'd like to know where to look. There are tremendous amounts of research out there um, on the internet, uh, the, the geological survey maps. And it starts with asking questions like, why are these animals here but not here? And understanding the geology and the environment of the time. Could they have been more diverse? 
Um, we know, just like our modern environments, we have a huge diversity of mammals. We have a huge diversity of birds. And the fossil record only gives us a narrow glimpse of our ancient history. But if we find one thing, it, it really lends, uh, it, it's intuitive that there would be a great diversity of those things. So we have to dig a little bit deeper into our fossil record to either prove or disprove that assumption. Now, once you find the fossils, um, once you figure out your assumption about where to find the fossils, you're gathering and, and compiling all available research uh, to add to clues to aid in the hunt. So historical photographs, newspaper articles, believe it or not, are actually a really great resource for some older discoveries and deposits in our state um, because they were found in rural places on farmland. Uh, I think a great example of this was a plesiosaur skeleton they found on a farm right before they built Cedar Creek, uh, Cedar Hill Lake, uh, Lake, Joe, Lake Joe Pool at Cedar Hill State Park. All right, that's a mouthful. Um, so there's this great newspaper paper article about this farmer, and he's squatting next to this articulated skeleton of this incredible plesiosaur specimen. Um, but there's really not a lot of scientific publications on it. So I love to scour newspapers and, and records like that for information to help me find fossils. There are treasure maps, and they do work, and those are geological survey maps. So if you know what approximate age the fossils that you're looking for are, you can use a geological survey map to find rocks that are that age and where they're exposed across our state. Um, I'm still old school, I love paper maps, but these are all available online and they're free. Um, so sometimes when I have downtime, which is not very often, but I'll pull my maps out and lay them on a table in the lab and I'll just trace with my finger along outcrops until I get to an intersecting highway or some way that I can access because the road maps are superimposed on top of the ge these geological survey maps. And once I have that information, I'll go to Google Earth and I'll visit it vir uh, virtually in satellite view and I'll look for large uh, exposures, uh, high erosive environments and that's the place to look to find fossils. So there's a whole process before you even you know, fill up the tank and, and hit the road. So these are some pictures of the results of that research. Um, it's such a reward to get to this part of the adventure. Field work is searching for evidence of fossils. And sometimes tiny fragments lead to big discoveries. And I mean tiny. Um, hands and knees is a common way to find me in the field. And if I'm really motivated, you'll see me with an optivider of optivisor on that's 5, 10, or 20x. And, I, and I'm basically, you know, checking out the ants on the ground. But these tiny little bone fragments are the first clues that something bigger is in the ground. Generally, when you're on an exposure uh, with large animals like dinosaurs, and you find a, a lot of bone on the surface, that's a good sign, but it's more so a bad sign because there was a large bone there 100, 200, 500 years ago. But through the freeze-saw cycle, uh, cycle and the processes of erosion, the most powerful force on Earth, uh, those bones are destroyed. So I don't want to find a big pile of fragments. I want to find tiny little fragments that tell me that there's something new that's just starting to emerge like a seed in the spring. Excavation and mapping to preserve all of the context of the site to be used in later research. This is so important because fossils are in limited in what they can tell us. The context of the site, the taphonomy, um, and all of the other small micro fossils and things that may be associated tell us more about the environment than the animal itself. The lab is another fun place. I love to spend a lot of time. Uh, you can see uh, my assistant lab manager there, Abby, 
She's a little bit stressed out. Um, lab work is some of the most stressful work because you've done everything to get this fossil safely into a controlled environment and we've done everything we could to document where it is inside the jacket but when you collect these fossils you expose them on the surface and you create a pedestal so we make it look like a mushroom we put a cap on what was exposed and we dig down and undercut the fossil and we flip it over and then we cap that side and sometimes if we're a little too excited about what we're doing we forget to label which side is which uh, so one's a little bit closer to the outside of the jacket than the other in this case uh, we forgot to do that and so when you're using a, a sawzall or a, a, a cutoff disc to open these jackets you can inadvertently cause damage and it's 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 really disheartening when that happens So preparation is the process of carefully preparing these bones for a study or display. And we use all kinds of tools. And again, this is one of those things where any skill you have can be ap applicable in paleontology. Um, dental laboratory uh, experience, um, sculpting, um, mechanic work, woodworking skills, because we, we need to uh, approach it from a different perspective every time. Every fossil is unique. And we meticulously clean the rocks and soil from the bones so that we can see them in their entirety. Uh, we can 3D scan them, we can mold and cast them, and that researchers can take clean samples for isotope study and other things that help give us more information about these ancient animals, the life that they lived, and sometimes the diets that they had. displaying the fossils to use to tell the story of our ancient history. This is my favorite part. This is when I get to use the art. So the fossils are done and I get to arrange them in a room and tell a compelling story about our ancient history. And I'm sure many of you have visited museums that made a lasting impact on you. And that is through all of the hard work of finding that fossil, getting it to the, getting it out of the field, preparing it, and putting it on display. But some thoughtful person, some exhibit designer, uh, really worked hard to make sure that that exhibit was meaningful and impactful, impactful for you. The importance of cultural context. Now, this is a really big deal for me, um, and one of the reasons why I found a Texas through time. Here we have Noah. Uh, he's one of our museum ambassadors. And uh, we have a lot of school groups that come through. And I, I love when kids come in because they have the wildest questions. And they're like, did, you know, in a fight between this dinosaur and that dinosaur, who do you think would win? And I was like, well, they didn't live at the same time. So my money's on the, on the youngest one because the, the oldest one's gone. Uh, but this is a, a replica of an Acrocanthosaurus skull. And this was found in McCurtain County, Oklahoma, but the tracks in Glen Rose, the big three-toed theropod tracks, were made by this dinosaur. The importance of keeping fossils close to the place of discovery is becoming clear as museums around the world have been recalling specimens because of cultural value of keeping them in large comprehensive collections. Um, the Met has returned some uh, artifacts uh, to Cambodia. Um, the British Museum has returned Egyptian artifacts to the Grand Egyptian Museum in, in Cairo. And museums around the world are now returning paleontological specimens because of the importance of keeping those close to the place of discovery. They mean more to us in our local stories and our state and regional history than they do in foreign museums. And in the beginning, paleontology was really a gold rush. Everybody was excited. There were so many scientific discoveries to be made. But little consideration was given to the fact that these, this heritage was being whisked away uh, to different countries across oceans, across continents, uh, even the Smithsonian. Um, it's free and it's open to the public, but very few people can travel to DC and stay there to, to enjoy these exhibits. And so part of our mission at Texas Through Time, and my mission per personally, 
is to preserve our local history and a regional history and preserve that cultural context. Significant fines. So this is probably going to be one of the questions, and I'm going to go ahead and answer it now. My favorite find. In 2018, I discovered a brand new genus of armored dinosaur. And this is the first armored dinosaur uh, ankylosaur ever discovered in the state of Texas. And this is very important because we thought these animals were here, but we had no evidence of them being here. So this was really exciting for me. And it was a result of going back to the beginning, how our fossils found. I asked a question, well, they're here, they're in Mexico. They're in New Mexico. They're everywhere throughout the Southwest and up into the North and Midwest. Why aren't they in Texas? Well, we have to go look in the right places to find them. So I started looking in the upper Campanian beds of the Aguja Formation. And at the end of the Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs, it goes Campanian, Maastrichtian, and then the big boom, and everything's gone. Um, so I figured if I moved back from that extinction event um, 10 million years, a lower in the section where more of the beds were exposed and more had been eroded, I had a greater chance of finding evidence of these dinosaurs. And all that hard work and perseverance paid off. It is the first ankylosaur ever found in the state of Texas. It is the most complete southernmost ankylosaur ever found in the U.S. and North America. Uh, it's the most inc complete ankylosaur from the discovery site in the Big Bend all the way to the tip of South America. And it also represents a brand new genus. So this thing has got five stars. You know, it's, it's an amazing specimen. Unfortunately, this one will not be named after me. I'm going to honor a certain Texas uh, country music uh, musician. So here are some bones of that animal. And while it wasn't a complete or articulated skeleton, articulated meaning the bones are still in their life position, uh, was associated. And interestingly, it was also a bone bed where we had four individuals, an adult, uh, two subadults and a juvenile, the first juvenile ankylosaur ever found in the U.S. So it's also the first ankylosaur bone bed. So seven stars. Uh, so the big lump on the on the right hand side here is actually half of the tail club, and that is the signature diagnostic feature of an ankylosaur. There's another group of armored dinosaurs that look very similar. They're called notosaurs. Same armor, same body design, no club on their tail. Um, the straight bones there in front of the club, that is called the handle. And those are fused caudal or tail vertebrae that essentially make that club a big hammer. And they're often depicted with their tail curled or something like that, but that club would not allow for that type of movement. So it's more likely that they swung their hips and their whole body in a sweeping motion and, uh, and used it in a defensive way. Building a Museum of Texas Paleo. I, I didn't know this was a dream until it was happening. Um, but this is, my passion for paleontology has really driven me to, to just explore the frontiers of the possibilities of this for, in my life. And this is, this is really wonderful. This building here was one of the first junior colleges in the state of Texas. Uh, it's in Hillsboro, and it's part of the Hill College Junior College system. It was built in 1923, and it will be the future home of Texas through time. Um, we founded our museum in a historic building on the square, and we have about 4,000 square feet of exhibit space. And this building is 10 times the size, so we have 40,000 square feet of exhibit space. And to prove that my ambition is endless. Uh, I visited this building with my Hillsborough Leadership Program, and we did a live fire training exercise with our local police department, which is super scary. Um, uh, little side story. Um, a lot of the people in our class seem to think that police officers um, are quick to pull the trigger. So our local police department set up this exercise to demonstrate that the amount of time that you have to make a decision to defend your life 
is almost instantaneous. So we use simunition, which is a brass cartridge with gunpowder in it and a paintball bullet on the tip. And these are Glock 17s. I mean, this is a this is a real weapon. Everybody that was the first to speak up and say cops shouldn't pull the trigger so fast were the first to pull the trigger so fast. <laughs> and uh, I ended up getting my phone shattered, and I got shot in the finger, and they drew blood. But it, it was very thrilling. And it was thrilling for more reasons than that. I was inside this building, and as I walked around in between our exercises, I thought, this is the next Texas through time. This is the next step. And so I wrote a letter to the Hillsborough Independent School District, and I said, why don't you give me that building, and I'll turn it into a museum. And they said yes. And so this building, thank you very much, uh, this building is deeded to Texas through time, and we are currently in the process of raising funds and working with our community to, to open it up, hopefully by the spring of 24, but certainly by the fall. In 2018, my wife Carrie and I founded the museum, and she wasn't too keen on the idea of me doing another thing, um, but also I think she realized that me doing another thing meant that it would be less annoying her doing things. Um, so, but she has been instrumental and a, a huge support. She serves as our administrator. Um, every position of the organization is volunteer at this point. We do hire some interns in the summer, uh, but it's really a passion project and, and a lot of people are behind us and my wife is certainly at the top of that list. The purpose was to build a museum of Texas paleontology. And that might seem redundant, but it's really not. The closest thing to Texas through time is the former Texas Mo Memorial Museum at University of Texas in Austin, now recently rebranded and reopened after 19 months of being closed as the Texas Science and Natural History Museum. Um, it's the closest thing we have it really serves as the state repository for fossils, um, but it's also a natural history museum and covers all of the things, um, First Nations, um, ethnographic art, um, geology, um, t weather, taxidermy. Um, so I wanted to narrow the scope of our mission and just focus on the paleontology. And no other museum in the state or the world has ever set their goal to be a museum of Texas paleontology. And currently, we have the most diverse collection of Texas fossils on display on planet Earth. This was also to preserve the um, cultural context of, of these objects, because so many of the finest fossils found in our state have been whisked away um, and it wasn't necessarily a bad thing at the, time, at the time. So I'm not disparaging those institutions. This is part of the evolution of science and um, cultural stewardship. It was also to create an equitable institution that is really accessible for all people. When my wife and I landed in Hill County, um, we noticed something that was really strange coming from the Metroplex, which is our county and Hillsboro is over 60% socioeconomically disadvantaged. So over 60% of the families in our county and in our city are living at or below poverty. And so the importance to me, uh, to me to build an institution that offers the same types of services and opportunities for our young people was really a driving factor in doing this. And one of the reasons why I've worked for five years and, and not been paid. The future of Texas paleontology. This, I think, is more exciting than the past. Um, our future is in the past, but our future is really bright. Texas is seeing a renewed interest in its fossils with almost every museum in the state now prioritizing making new discoveries here. This again goes back to the Texas Paleontology Museum. Um, former director of the Pro Museum, Tony Ferrello, was working on the North Slope of Alaska, found Pachyrhinosaurus, Nanuxaurus, uh, which is a new Tyrannosaur, made some incredible discoveries. 
but spent almost a decade digging on the north slope of Alaska and the museums in Dallas. And we have incredible dinosaur beds. Um, that's just one example of people kind of looking past or looking over our state's natural resources. And I felt um, and still feel that the future of Texas paleontology has, we, we, we haven't even seen that yet. I mean, this is just the beginning. This will almost certainly continue to make headlines, you know, featuring new Texas dinosaurs and significant finds to de for decades to come. And the reason for that is even if we found 100 new dinosaurs in the next two years, it would be 20 years, 40 years, 100 years before the research and manuscript, manuscripts could be written uh, to publish all of that science. There is a tremendous amount of work after the fossils have been collected, prepared, preserved, conserved, put in collections, um, precise measurements. You have to visit collections with similar animals all over the world. Anywhere there's a similar specimen that could be the same or different in a peer-reviewed paper, you have to observe that specimen or get the, um, the diagnostic information from it so that your science is sound. This will also mean there will be many opportunities for young paleontologists right here in their own backyard. You don't have to join a program and travel to Madagascar or go to the Gobi Desert or to the North Slope of Alaska. Literally, you have McFadden Beach right here in your own backyard. Um, and that's one of the places where I think the future of Texas paleontology lies. You have this tremendous paleontological resource right here in your own backyard. And I jotted down a few facts that I did not put in my slide. Um, and I found this really interesting. It's one of the few parts of the state that I've never made it to. And so you might see a lot more of me down here beachcombing. Uh, the Beaumont Formation is just two meters below the surface. So a lot of places we only find fossils where they're exposed. But some of the best case scenarios are where these fossil rich beds are just beneath the surface. So where there's any kind of disturbance through construction, road building, a storm erosion, it exposes fossils that haven't been weathered for many, many years. The Beaumont Formation represents 28 to 135,000 years of our history here in the state of Texas and the Gulf Coast Plains. Bison, horses, llamas, camels, sloths, um, they're all present in these deposits. And that's really remarkable because the largest land animal in North America was the mammothus columbi, the Columbian mammoth. And you can find those teeth on McFadden Beach right here in your community. So if you're a, a motivated uh, young scientist or an old scientist um, and you have an interest, start here in your community. Don't look somewhere else because you have tremendous resources right here. Uh, however, it's best known for Paleo-Indian and archaic artifacts, which I've always kind of heard that, but I didn't know how really truly impressive it was. More Clovis po points have been found here at McFadden Beach than any other county in the state of Texas. Texas is a big place, and we had a lot of Paleo-Indian cultures here. So that really says something about how rich and fertile the hunting grounds were for those ancient Indians. Um, remarkably, more Clovis points have been found here than at the Galt site, which is the best Paleo-Indian archaeological site um, anywhere in the state of Texas. And they've been meticulously excavating centimeter by centimeter for years. But still, more Clovis points have been found on McFadden Beach than anywhere in the state of Texas. So the future of paleontology and archaeology, if that's your thing, uh, it, it's right here. It's right in your own backyard. And I really encourage you to read up on your local history, um, find some resources, connect with a local fossil and mineral club or gem and mineral club because there's usually somebody that has a, a dual interest in those clubs. And that's a great place to start. Passing the torch. This is probably the most important 
uh, aspect of the entire process of paleontology. We are constantly building knowledge on top of knowledge. And so often we get so focused on the task at hand that we overlook opportunities. Paleontology is a unique science which captures your attention for a lifetime and leaves, leaves little time to consider anything else. And that's really true. Um, there was a paleontologist who passed away uh, during the pandemic. His name was Dr. Carter, worked at, um, worked at SMU. He was brilliant, but he didn't think that he would ever die. No. Um, and he passed away suddenly and his, so much research was left undone, and his entire life's work, all of his knowledge, was never passed on because he just thought that he was going to keep going. And I think it's really important that we use institutions like Texas Through Time and local history museums like McFadden Ward House to mentor our young people, to pass the torch, to preserve that knowledge through oral history and sharing whatever information that we can, uh, because that is another place um, I don't trust the cloud. I don't keep a lot of stuff there. Uh, this is not an endorsement or a diss. It's just I, I like to know where that information is. And so sharing it personally with people and sharing books, um, I think that's a wonderful way to engage our, our future scientists. Mentoring, training, the next generation needs to be a higher priority. And Texas Through Time hopes to lead the way. How can you help small museums? I think you guys know the answer to that question. But sm uh, supporting small museums like McFadden Ward House and others like Texas Through Time scattered across the state is of paramount importance. Um, it's wonderful what I've learned about Mamie McFadden and how passionate she was about preserving history. And she was very thoughtful about putting safeguards in place and passing the torch and preserving history. Volunteerism is far more valuable than money in most cases for institutions like ours. Docents, uh, volunteers to clean cases, um, supporting events like this, uh, it's really human capital is so much more valuable than writing a check. However, that is important as well. So I encourage you to plug into a local museum uh, I don't know how many volunteers for the McFadden Ward House we have in the room tonight, but if you're not one, I encourage you to look into it and be a part of this wonderful local history. The future of museums is small. Um, I wrote a, a short essay. It's, it's out there on the front desk if you uh, grabbed a copy. It's really my case for why the large institutions, they're important, uh, they're well-funded, um, they have really good systems in place for curation, and they've done a lot of amazing research. But the Smithsonian's and American uh, Museums of Natural History and LA County Museums, they don't serve you. They are there for you if you can visit them, but they don't serve you. So I believe that the model moving forward, serving rural populations and underserved communities, is a small model. It makes us more dynamic. It makes us more engaging and creates opportunities that directly impact the communities that they serve. You guys recognize that place? <laughs> That's me with my pet crocodile. <laughs> um, that is a replica that we had for our Laramidia exhibit. And I'll give you a little bit of a paleo tidbit there. During the late, well, early to late Cretaceous, the United States was divided east and west by the Western Interior Seaway. And that's why most of Texas is covered in limestones and, and abundant marine fossils. The Western island or continent was called Laramidia, and the Eastern was called Appalachia. And this terrifying animal behind me was called Rio, uh, Dinosuchus rio grandensis. And this was an alligatoroid, but we call it a crocodile. And uh, it got up to 40 feet long. That we know of. 
so the thing about reptiles, though, is that there's no limit to how big they can get. I mean, it's space, time, and food. And if there's enough of the three of those things, there's really no limit. We keep finding larger and larger dinosaurs that are just blowing our minds and really pose some serious engineering questions about how that's even possible. My journey, much like the rough fossils we bring back from the field, has been a slow and steady endeavor. And the rewards are truly um, priceless. The opportunity to speak to groups like yourself, um, the many school groups that we get at Texas Through Time, has been one of the most satisfying things I've ever done besides being a husband and a father. So I just really want to give back and I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you tonight. The opportunities that I've had to raise my children through this process and guide many young scientists through uh, their journey, um, again, is, is priceless. So often we're encouraged to change the world, be a world changer. But what does that really mean? It means that you do have to make an impact that will change the world in some way. But if you change the world for one person, you have changed the world. So again, this goes back to mentoring and encouraging people and their interests. Change the world for one person and you have changed the world. And thank you for the opportunity to share my story here. Um, I'm really grateful and I would love to answer the many questions that I'm sure you have. Yes. Um, Romer was a scientist for AM&H, a paleontologist. His name was Edward Drinker Cope. Uh, Alfred Sherwood Romer. <laughs> oh. Yeah. You said something about that was a memorable name. It was a memorable name because he was a paleontologist who wrote the book. There's a book called Review of the Pelicosaur, and there's uh, vertebrate paleontology volumes that he wrote he wrote the Bible of Permian vertebrate paleontology. And what was really cool about that is he had an intuitive style that has proven to be true to this day. So a lot of paleontology was based on these assumptions and we find a fossil and we slap it together and we're like, okay, we're gonna name this animal. And a lot of those genuses are junk now, they're dubious. Um, but Romer was spot on. He just really understood anatomy and osteology and the biology of these animals that he could have never seen in, in person. We have a question in the back. Uh, if I, if I so, if I heard your question correctly, <laughs> Do you want to glue a dinosaur bone to your shirt? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't I I don't recommend that. Uh and in fact, I don't recommend gluing anything anywhere near your body. Um uh, Yes. What about tape? Okay, I can see where this is going. I don't recommend attaching fossils with any <laughs> adhesive material to your body. <laughs> yes, sir. Personally, uh, so, so a single bone or a, or a skeleton? Uh, right now, I'm working at Como Bluffs in Wyoming, and this is where Cope and Marsh had their bone wars, and this was in the late 1890s. And these guys were, I mean, this was the wild west of paleontology. They were literally dynamiting each other's quarries to prevent them from bringing d uh, fossils from the field to the museum so they could beat each other to the research. Uh, and there was shootouts. So, yeah. <laughs>
Wow. So at Como, we were hired by a museum in Wyoming, the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. Beautiful museum up there in Thermopolis if you ever make it through on your way to the parks. Um, they contracted us to go and scout for a new, a new quarry and excavate and map and prepare and all of those things. Uh, so we found an Apatosaurus skeleton. And so this dinosaur is probably going to be 90 feet long. Yeah. So it's, it's currently the largest... Okay. So, let me see. <laughs> so this long-necked dinosaur here, uh, we've all seen Land Before Time. Littlefoot's parents. Yeah. Yes. So if I recommend that you reach out to your local geology department if you have a local paleontology museum. Um, and it, it doesn't cost anything to send a picture. Um, if you're comfortable taking it in and the institution is comfortable having you bring something in, that's always the best case because identifying things from a photo, there's a lot of issues there. My big thing is scale. If, you, if your photograph doesn't have a standard scale in it, I'll just tell you, I don't know what it is. Um, and I get blurry photos in the dark and on carpet and all kinds of things. And I'm like, put it on a nice contrasting background with something for scale. Yes. Invertebrates are cool, but they're not really my thing. And Texas is not really well known for trilobites. We do have some in the Pennsylvania, uh, up in Jacksboro. There's a few in the Smithwick Formation in Central Texas, and there's some out west. But mainly trilobites are found up in the Midwest, uh, East Coast, and but there's really some great trilobites in, in Oklahoma. But that stuff is buried under North Texas, so not well exposed. Yes. What is, when you go out to your findings, what is the material, the difference between a rock and the bone? How do you distinguish that? When you go out there and you go, oh, I found a gem. Is it the gem? What, what do you look for in the material? That is a great question. So what do I look for? What, how do I tell the difference between bone and rock? Um, so the first thing is, I would ask you a question. How do you know the difference between an oak tree and a pecan tree? It's the shape of the leaves. It's the texture of the bark. It's the type of fruit that they make. So there's all these um, diagnostic features that you can observe that are superficial that are going to help you at least narrow it down. Um, if the fossil or rock is broken and you can see a cross section of it, you should see um, an interior bone structure that looks spongy even if it's very silicified, it's got a high silica co content and is, is very rock hard, um, those structures would be preserved. Um, some bones are not permineralized. They might look like a modern cow bone. I've seen mammoth bones that are, they, they feel like they're made of styrofoam because they've demineralized and they've become very brittle and friable. Um, but they preserve those structures that show you the cancellous, the, the surface bone or the cortical bone and the interior bone as well. I've heard a lot of geologists and paleontologists say, stick it to your tongue, and if it sticks to your tongue, it's bone. If it doesn't, when I was on a field trip with the Dallas Paleontological Society, and this gentleman, um, somebody walked up to him, he's a paleontologist, and they said, is this bone? And he said, let me see. And he stuck it to his tongue, and before I could say anything, he was like, and it was a dried rabbit turd. <laughs> I was like, no, no, oh, well, maybe he'll stop telling people to put stuff in their mouth. <laughs> yes, young man. Yes. Yes, I have held a 13-inch rooted Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth, and it will give you goosebumps. 
Um, it, it earned the name Tyrant Lizard King for a reason. Yes. I went to a program at Lamar that there's a guy who's done a lot of study on T Rex that he, he agrees it is, it was a carnivore for sure, but he thinks it was primarily a scavenger and not a predator because of the, um, the ratio of the thigh and leg bones that it's more of a walking animal, more like humans rather than, say, a chicken or a racehorse. So I, I do subscribe to that theory. Um, they had a very in, enlarged olfactory system to allow them to yeah. smell and, yep, their stereo vision. Um, I think a good analog is the hyena. Um, they're bone crushers, right? So they steal kills from other animals. And generally those animals predators in the field in highly competitive environments like that they'll eat the entrails first they'll gnaw, gnaw a limb off and drag it off somewhere because they know that somebody's coming to steal that kill and hyenas are often left with very little meat on the bone and that's why they have those crusher teeth and tyrannosaurus rex um, has that same feature uh, those teeth unlike many other theropods, which are razor sharp and serrated, they're very robust and they're very blunt. They're not made for penetrating, they're made for crushing. So the theory of Tyrannosaurus rex being more primarily a scavenger versus a predator, a predator I think makes sense from, from the fossil evidence. Yes. And would it be possible that a T Rex might have done predation by, for example, stepping on it? My horse stepped on one of my guineas one time. <laughs> so I, I think anything's possible. The horse didn't eat it, though. <laughs> yes, sir. That is true. There's, there's a little um, parallel evolution in, in several things. I'm not exactly sure about the camels um, in that regard, but I do know that our early camels here in the Oligocene and the White River group up in the Dakotas and uh, Nebraska uh, started, and they were the size of house cats. So kind of kind of cool. You know, camels are big animals, but they started as itty-bitty animals. Yes, ma'am. How do you know? Cause he's an cause he's an old dinosaur. <laughs> I figured somebody would get that. Yes, in the back. Oh. Yes. Did you work on the mammoth park out of Waco? We we have not. We may be help. Uh, we may be assisting them with a backlog of jackets that they pulled out of the field. Um, a long time ago, uh, but I but I haven't done any work uh, with them. They are now part of the National Park Service. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, there's a question in the back, young man. We would be really good friends. <laughs> so I, no, I'm glad you answer you asked that question because one of my personal uh, curiosities and interests within fossils is fossils that are gems. And it does happen. Uh, there are mammal bones from New Mexico and Arizona that are preserved in turquoise. Um, there are some bivalves from the Sangria de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico that are garnetized. So 
the uh, through metamorphic processes, the g garnet gems have grown in those endocasts into the shape of the fossil. Um, there are clams from uh, Crimea in the Ukraine that are infilled with rhodochrosite. Um, I've seen fossils from the um, from South America in the Amazon jungle, large gastropods that inside their geodes and they're full of vivianite crystals. So they're, they're, that happens. You could find a fossil with the gem attached to it. Yes, ma'am. I have not, and I, I tried to look into it. Um, I don't, I think because of erosive issues, there's no excavations on the beach. I did read about a test that they did in the 80s and again in the 90s, a test pit to kind of see what's going on, and that's how they found out the, the formation is just two meters under the surface, and the concentrations are pretty consistent throughout. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any uh, excavation there. It's more of a you know, surface collecting situation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Um, what was the, uh, biggest omnivore? Ooh. Biggest omnivore. In North America, it was the Colombian mammoth. So a bull mammoth would stand about 13 feet at the shoulders. That's a big elephant. They could have 14 foot long tusks, sometimes longer. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've I've read some some papers on that, and I it's a they don't. I don't know that it's really been determined whether it's a rhinoceros or whether it's a, a proboscidean, or they're kind of unsure. It's one of those oddballs in the fossil record, and right, it's yeah, almost like a giraffe. So the problem with some of those discoveries. And this is a this is a rule throughout paleontology. Sample size is everything. Um, there's always going to be these outliers. There's always going to be these oddball discoveries, and we can name new taxa based on a single specimen or a partial specimen. But until we have a, a holotype and a paratype and and a, a large sample size to compare to, we're really just kind of making assumptions. And paleo artists love love love. <laughs> these oddball fossils because they're like well I know what it looks like <laughs> and nobody can tell me I'm wrong <laughs> yes sir yes so the Cambrian explosion is when we really see the first uh, global diversity of trial bites um, like most things in the fossil record they have roots that run a little deeper um, but I would say um, the Devonian, we've, we've got some early trilobites, and there's probably some a little earlier. But the Cambrian is when they're really uh, diversified and, and present uh, globally. Yes, sir. Uh, when someone brings a fossil to a pawn shop, uh, what's the answer? <laughs> Did you say rent? No. When they bring a oh. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> um, so I have been fortunate with my expertise and experience to be uh, tapped by the History Channel to be the fossil expert on their show, Pond Stars. So I, so I, I often get called by. Thank you. I often get called up by Rick and Chum to fly to Vegas or wherever they are and, and look at and appraise these things. I will tell you that 99.9% .9 of pawn shops will tell you to take a hike. Um, but if you happen to make it to Vegas, Rick will probably take a look at it.
want to thank you to, for being with us tonight. I have a bag of incredible fossil finds from the Mickey. All right. <laughs> including the elusive <coughs> McFadden Ward House coffee cup. And uh, also uh, uh, a book from uh, uh, prior speakers. I know you're working on a book, so when it's done, um, if you'll um, sell us a few copies, we'll give it to future speakers. Well, that would be my pleasure. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.